Welcome to Nightmares and Grief, a place to explore and celebrate the darkness. Each episode, I'll read stories written by me, Derek Heisey. So settle in, check under the bed, and pour a drink for the skeletons in your closet. It's time to start. The Horse Farm The first thing he tried to remember was his name, but against the too bright sunlight pouring through the window, combined with the soreness that blanketed his body like a second skin of pain, he was helpless to recall. The sugary bird song scraped against his ears and added an ache to his throbbing head. When he massaged his forehead, he discovered bandages and a large bump protruding above his right eyebrow. His name. His name. Its form hovered above the tip of his tongue. He could practically suck on it. It bore the savory metallic tang of blood. He could not recall his name, and the hole it left in his memory filled slowly with orange panic. He inspected the small Spartan room. It was quaint and rustic, with knotted cedar walls and a monochromatic rug stretched over the hardwood floor. He ran a hand over the smooth bed frame, and it occurred to him that it was polished pine. The thought seemed foreign, even a little invasive, as he couldn't place the knowledge's origin. Beside the heavy, dark door stood a mahogany wardrobe. At the foot of the bed sat a chest with a small pile of neatly folded clothes. He realized he was wearing a gown. The clothes must be his. The room felt so familiar, yet distantly so. The familiarity lived on the tip of his tongue right beside his name. Herbie. It came to him like coming out of a dream. My name is Herbie Caxton, he said. Well, isn't that interesting? Herbie flung his gaze around the room, instantly regretting it. His brain sloshed in his skull and his head pounded harder. But once he regained his composure, it was clear that he was alone. His eyes braved the strong sunlight pouring from the window directly beside the bed. It was open. Distant waves crashed against a shore. A grassy field stretched to a narrow beach, but the cool, clean air lacked the tinge of salt. A horse stepped into view. It clopped over the grass, approaching not more than five feet away. Its cream-colored coat shone in the strong sun, as did its clean obsidian mane. A striking black stripe ran down its snout. Lowering its head, it grazed beside the window. Herbie studied the scene for a reverent moment. The sighing water, the sparse rustling trees, the bright gilded sunlight, the lazy breeze, and the picturesque horse brought to mind the strum of a guitar, a collection of happy notes plucked gently over piano chords. He could smell the wooden room. He could smell the horse's musky spore. He could smell the earthy grass. But he could not smell the sea. Where was he? The horse raised its head and glowered at Herbie. They locked eyes and an electric awareness buzzed Herbie's gut. The horse had come so close its breath kissed his cheeks as it huffed at him. Herbie reached out a tentative hand to touch the horse's snout, but it snorted loudly and flung its great mane in disapproval. Sorry, sorry. You're just so pretty, Caxton said. The horse. The horse helped him remember. He was on the island. The door opened and closed, and before he could see who had entered, a voice commanded, Please, lay back down. The voice's strength suggested that, despite the kindly phrasing, it was not a request. 
Herbie whirled around to see the voice's owner, but the room swirled again and a fist of nausea punched him square in the gut. He squeezed his eyes shut and lay his head on the pillow, fighting down the wave of nausea. Hard-soled footsteps clacked over the hardwood as the voice approached. It said, gruffly, You took a nasty spill on the road. Fragments flashed across Herbie's mind. The fairy. The car. The horse. The horse. Nothing broken, but you have a concussion. Rather serious. Don't worry, though, we are very used to concussions here. I've been asleep, Herbie said, concerned slashing across his words. Are, are you supposed to sleep when you have a concussion? I, I always see in the movies that you're not supposed to sleep. He felt good enough to turn his head. A stiff man entered his vision, lean and a little short. He stood remarkably straight in a black, old-fashioned suit with shiny golden buttons. Beady little blue eyes peered through a pair of frameless rectangular spectacles, and the stony line of his mouth hid beneath a thick but well-kept goatee. A misconception, I suppose, for dramatic effect? The man in the black suit put his large square bag on the chest at the foot of the bed and opened it and rummaged through. I am Dr. Bruce Vernon. Many tourists fall off horses here, and I prescribe them all rest. Dr. Vernon pointed to the window. I pushed your bed against the window because I have found that, in my experience, the fresh air assists in the healing of concussions. He reached for a long stethoscope around his neck and put it on. Placing the cold metal disc against Herbie's chest under the gown, Dr. Vernon said, Tell me your name. Caxton. First or last? Herbie Caxton. Short for Herbert? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess. Dr. Vernon paused for a moment and seemed to lose focus. Yes, he said, all gruffness evaporating from his speech. It normally is, in my experience. The stethoscope returned to its place around his neck, and he extracted a pen light from the bag. Lifting Herbie's eyelid, he clicked on the light, eliciting a groan from Herbie who squeezed his eyes shut and turned away. Quite certainly a concussion. Do you remember what happened? Not really. You said there was an accident? The doctor progressed to the next eye, and Herbie groaned again. Memory loss is typical of concussions. There was a car accident. You killed a horse. He tucked the little flashlight back into his suit. Oh, Herbie said, and his face fell. Slowly, the pieces came together in his mind. Silence occupied a few moments as Dr. Vernon inspected Herbie's eyes closely. At last, the doctor produced a notepad and a fountain pen. What is your occupation? Vernon cocked an eyebrow and looked severely at Herbie, his face angled away with skepticism. Herbie hesitated. He clenched his eyes and rested a hand on his forehead. He thought about the notes he'd heard earlier when he looked out the window. I write music, he said, moving his hand in small circular motions as if reeling something in. Like, like John Williams, he added. Certainly, certainly. The pen scribbled a few irate scratches against the rough paper. Do you know where you are? Vernon asked, firing an intense stare at Herbie over his glasses. The island. The doctor continued his unwavering, impatient gaze. Here's a lied, Herbie corrected. The gaze dropped and the pen scratched away. That's correct, Mr. Caxton. This is the town of Herzalide. Can you tell me what state you're in? Caxton responded to the doctor with a measure of weariness. Uh, Wisconsin. It's an island off the coast of Wisconsin on Lake Michigan. Very good. Very good. You seem to be doing well, but while I am sure you came for the horses, I simply cannot allow you to partake. You'll be left in bed for a few days until I feel the fresh air has healed your concussion, though I may need to keep you here longer if it is a particularly complicated case. He removed his glasses, fogged them, and then wiped them with a dark handkerchief. 
After replacing his spectacles, he continued, However, I won't be able to determine if this is the case until later. His voice brightened when he said, We have reading material for you. The doctor opened a drawer in the nightstand, and the force of the sudden movement caused a small, black, leather-bound Bible to slide forward. It was a King James Version. I do recommend sleep instead of reading, though. Dr. Vernon met Herbie's gaze again, and the steely intensity of his frosted eyes made him feel uncomfortable. Less stress on the brain and a quicker recovery time. At any rate, I imagine the hotel staff will be with you shortly to arrange for your amenities. With that, Dr. Vernon made his way to the door. Herbie stopped him. Hotel staff? he asked. Dr. Vernon stopped at the door and turned. We are a historical town, Mr. Caxton, and very proud of that fact. We do not have a hospital. As such, I make house calls. He forced something like a smile, opened his exit, and said, Welcome to Hare's Lied, Mr. Caxton. It was no trouble for him to sleep. Something in the air at Hare's Lied was heavy with drowsiness and the sound of Lake Michigan rolling against the shore soon had him sifting through a splintered dreamscape. He thought it was a dream, but there were parts that felt like memory tinted and rotten with time. There was a woman, beautiful, with dark hair, and there was an argument. Then there was a, a horse cream colored with a black stripe down its snout who threw back its inky mane in laughter the sound was horrible a mocking whinny out of tune and burned at the edges then there was a flash of light and a pool of deep red spread across knotted cedar floors a wine glass lay in the center of the pool in a few dozen shattered pieces a voice screamed a name in his ear distorted and grainy like an old radio transmission and while the word wasn't his it was as familiar as if it had been he opened his eyes, and lightning arced across his skull. No chipper bird song greeted him on the other side of the open window. The world was illuminated solely by the bright moon, which reminded him of a bleached skull hanging against the dark, star-spattered sky. He pressed the heel of his palm against his eyes and clutched his forehead with his fingers, careful to avoid the tender lump. Outside, the pallid light illuminated the field. In the middle distance, almost unrecognizable in the shroud of darkness, he recognized a cream-colored horse with a black stripe down its snout. Then he heard whispers, feverish and shrewd, but when he whirled his head to gaze around the room, it was empty. The horse had vanished when he looked out the window again. Birds babbled and whistled when Herbie Caxton awoke. The lake sighed in the distance and the sky's deep blue was so bright it nearly sparkled. It was a beautiful summer day. He enjoyed it for a little while, sat in the peace and tranquility and the beauty, but was not allowed to linger. The pain in his head crescendoed into a long, monotone throb. It made him nauseous and struck him with a dizzying fuzz of confusion. He forgot where he was. Herbie toppled from the bed and onto the floor, where he knocked over a metal pail. It clamored as he straightened it up, managing to right it just before vomiting. An acrid stink rose from the bucket and mixed with the room's natural perfume of leather and cedar. It was disgusting and appropriate. The door clicked open and Herbie turned his face away to wipe the residual grime from his mouth. He cleared his throat and pushed the bucket out of sight, welcoming the long-haired blonde girl with a sheepish smile and a weary, hello. The girl did not smile back. She kept her eyes averted to the floor. She carried a tray burdened with the aroma of soup and bread. The smell almost made Herbie vomit again. 
eyes still focused on a knot in the wood floor, the girl spoke. They thought you would want some breakfast. She glanced at the pail, and Herbie detected the smallest of shivers. He looked at the bucket and then apologized quietly. She would not look at him. He crawled into bed, and she placed the tray on the side table. She was about to scuttle away when he said, My name's Herbie. He smiled, hesitating before hastily adding, It's, uh, it's, it's short for Herbert. Back turned to him, the lines of her body tense. She answered with silence. She turned around slowly, at last raising her eyes, big and blue as the summer sky outside, to meet his. Those eyes matched the apron tied tight around her waist. She averted her face again, and the long yellow hair spilled over the black button dress she wore. Caxton smiled again, this time less genuinely. I... I, I, I don't bite. The woman's head snapped up, her expression a mix of disbelief and something close to fear. Her face conveyed submission and total discomfort, and when she opened her mouth, the sound she made echoed that same unsettling emotion. You killed a horse. It, 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 was, it was an accident, Caxton stammered in defense. It wasn't a pleasant feeling defending himself against a crime he hardly had memories of committing. She said nothing, but those eyes spoke. She snatched the handle of the sick-filled bucket, skittered away to the door, and exited in a smooth, swift arc. Kirby wondered what he'd done to the horse to have elicited such fear. He looked out the window and wondered about the things he did not know. They came again that night, those dreams that were memories. The day was beautiful. The windows of the old sedan were rolled down and the wind whipped over the peaceful sounds of the soundtrack to seven yellow hens, his towering achievement. It was the only soundtrack he'd won an award for, and he was quite proud of it. He was happy, and it was good. But clouds slashed through the sky, scrawling gray, incoherent messages of doom. Blue became black, and the seat slid away, ripping his hands from the wheel and pulling his foot off the gas. But the car still moved. The engine roared as it accelerated. The pleasant road became treacherous, knotted with potholes and caked with mud. Lightning illuminated haunting figures by the roadside and rain pelted the car with a tattoo that reminded him of a funeral dirge. He couldn't stop the car. The old sedan hit a pothole. A stack of CDs on a passenger seat took to the air. They tumbled to the car's floor with a sound like crackling fire. You'd better get those, someone said. It came from the back seat, but when he turned to see, no one occupied the space. The voice had a body, deep and elegant like stained glass, accented in a prim way that mocked him. He obeyed the voice. When he reached down to pick up the CDs, another bolt of lightning lit them up like rainbows. They were beautiful. He sat back up and placed the CDs on the seat. When he brought his eyes back to the road, there was a horse. It was a horse, cream-colored, with a black stripe down its snout. It jumped over a fence and into the road, and, and he couldn't stop the car. He heard that horrible laughter, that burned, blackened laughter, and he was terrified. His foot slammed against the floor, but he couldn't stop the car. He couldn't stop any of it. Tonight, the lake was angry. Its sighs crescendoed into crashing roars as if they attacked the earth of Herzlide in response to atrocity. Outside the open window, the pale moonlight sparkled across the chopping waves like jagged, opalescent scales. It reminded Herbie of his dream. As he stared and pondered, two figures walked along the beach. 
Herbie could only make out their words through the calm spaces between the furious surf. The island is small. We know everyone here. Who else? But Bruce says he couldn't even get out. What the doctor says. People don't just vanish. Not here. But people don't just do... Just don't do that. The tide rolled in and filled the silence between the two men. Until the search party comes back. Then we'll know. I can't believe. He trailed off, and there was silence until the water came again. Just unconscionable. A third voice appeared and distracted Herbie from the conversation. This one was close, right outside the window. Someone's made an awful mess of things. The horse walked into the frame of his sight, just a few feet from the window pane. It turned its elegant head and inserted it into the room through the open space. They're talking about Jeffrey Hansen. Who is that, do you suppose? Herbie stirred, groaning with the momentum of his sleep. There was a shriek and the sound of something shattering. Bolting up in bed was a mistake. He paid for it with a bout of nausea and a searing bolt of pain slicing through his head and body. He groaned again and squeezed his eyes shut to suppress both sensations. When Herbie opened them, the girl with the yellow hair and the blue apron stood in the middle of the room with a hand over her mouth. At her feet lay a tray of broken dishes and scrambled eggs and a puddle of coffee. I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She stammered, repeating it again and again as she lowered the alabaster hand. She dropped to her knees and picked up the shards of ceramic, still muttering apologies. The sick and pain lingered, so with some difficulty, Herbie asked, Are you all right? She didn't say a word. She only nodded frantically, those tiny hands shivering with the cold of fear. What's wrong? He asked, words laced with concern. Her pace slowed, and she absent-mindedly placed a piece of broken coffee mug on the tray. She snapped her head up and glared at Caxton. Her lips trembled, and her pale face was damp and flushed. Why did you come here? She demanded, her voice cracking. What do you want? Herbie faltered. It was strange that the question was difficult to answer. I... I want to ride the horses, he answered. The girl grabbed the handles of the tray and slammed it against the floor again and again. The shards of the plate and the mug exploded into the air. No, 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 she screamed. Why can't any of you just leave us alone? We don't bother anyone. We just want to raise our horses. Just leave us all alone. She slumped her head back, propping herself solely by the palms of her hands, not caring that they were deep in eggs, potatoes, and coffee. Tears spattered onto the tray, and her body heaved with heavy sobs. The girl didn't bother wiping them away. She didn't bother containing them, either. Hard-soled footsteps galloped through the hallway, and Dr. Vernon appeared in the open doorway. He glanced first at Herbie, and then at the girl. "'Sarah,' he whispered with fatherly quiet as he approached her, reaching out. She turned her red, wet, grief-twisted face to him. Vernon knelt beside her and hugged her. "'Everything is all right.' Sarah leaned forward and buried her face in his chest, clutching his lapels with her dirty hands. She sobbed. The doctor leered at Herbie. The ice in his eyes had melted. He helped the girl to her feet and held her tight as he led her out of the room, stopping to cast a quick, accusatory glance over his shoulder before closing the door behind him. That night, the horse appeared again and woke him by tapping the center of his chest 
and he could tell it was a stallion because it was dressed in a dark blue tuxedo. The horse wore a matching bow tie, a monocle over its glinting left eye, and immaculate white gloves over the small, delicate hands where its hooves should have been. It leaned into the room and opened the window, propping its elbows against the sill. Do you like music? The horse asked. I, I, I write it, the man replied. Ah, the horse said, pulling the sound long and slow. It turned its head to peer at the man through the monocle, and its eye flashed knowingly. That is fascinating, isn't it? That I like music? I guess. I like it enough to make it. You may call me Robert. The horse extended a hand, and they shook. Nice to meet you, Robert. Herbie Caxton. Robert gasped. <gasps> the Herbie Caxton? The man nodded. Yeah. I love what you did for Seven Yellow Hens. It's your finest work, I believe. Herbie smiled. Thanks. I thought so, too. Strange. In photographs, you always looked a bit... older. Uh, t tell me. His voice became quick and excited. Did, did you solve my riddle? Pardon? In regards to Jeffrey Hansen, did you ever figure out who he was? Herbie shook his head. No, I, I, I haven't had enough time. That's a shame. Try to figure it out tomorrow. Would you, would you mind terribly if I brought my copy of Seven Yellow Hens and had you sign it? And my best of Caxton? No, not at all. Would you like some tea? The horse gestured to a table behind him on the grass, wrought from curled tongues of iron. A silver teapot set in the middle of the glass overlay. Two dainty china teacups sat on either side. Thunder rolled with the lake. Herbie smiled. I, I would, thanks. But of course, Robert bared his teeth. It was supposed to be a smile, but it was unnerving. As the horse approached the table, it asked, How many sugars, Mr. Caxton? What kind of tea is it? Orange pico and spice. I, I've never had it. Give it to me straight. Ah, uh, as a man should. Robert grinned, pouring the tea. He handed the warm cup to the man, and wisps of steam twisted and twirled in the still night air. Thunder rolled again. I appreciate it. Herbie closed his eyes as he sipped and he kept them closed as he enjoyed it. That's good, thank you. He opened his eyes, but looked into the tea. By the way, do you happen to know what's going on here? The man looked out the window. Robert and the table were gone. Herbie Caxton vomited again. He set the sick-filled bucket on the floor and wiped his mouth as he took a deep breath. The air was thick today, coming off the lake in heavy, humid buffets. The birds were silent, and having only the ambience of the tumultuous waves unsettled Herbie. Combined with the dark sky, Herzlide's atmosphere made him shudder. The door to his room opened, but he did not look to see who entered until he heard a throat clear. The doctor looked awful. Dark phantoms sagged beneath his eyes, which were hollow and distracted. The icy fury normally occupying them had dulled to a pathetic gleam mostly absorbed by the dirty lenses of his crooked glasses. He didn't wear his coat today, opting instead for a vest and wrinkled white shirt with sleeves rolled to his elbows. Morning, Mr. Caxton. You okay, doctor? Dr. Vernon took out his pen light and clicked it on, reaching for Caxton's eyes again. Oh, uh, we've seen better days. Is everything all right? I think your concussion is healing. It's the fresh air. The doctor pointed at the open window and smiled faintly. Fresh air fixes better than time. He stood in silence for a moment, 
holding the little light idly in his hand. The silence perturbed Herbie. Doctor, who is Jeffrey Hansen? The name drew the weary man back into the room. The empty eyes were suddenly filled with darkness. They connected with Herbie's. Who did you say? Jeffrey Hansen. Who indeed? That is a very, very good question. I often ponder that myself. Herbie waited for a response. It did not come directly. How have you been feeling? Nauseous? Dizzy? Had any blurred vision or trouble focusing? I've been all right. I, I puked when I woke up. Have you been... reading? Vernon's eyes glanced at the nightstand with a glimmer of hope. But the glance was quick, and it returned its intense attention to the patient. Herbie smiled. Nope. I took your advice. I've been sleeping a lot. The doctor nodded slightly, smiled brief and nervous, and his eyes gazed intensely into Herbie's. They stared unblinking, as if the doctor were speaking with a cobra. I suppose you would be. Sleeping, that is. It's good, though. He averted his face. It's good for the concussion. Like an afterthought, Dr. Vernon put on his stethoscope and pressed it against Herbie's chest. He moved it around his patient like he was searching for something, and his hand quivered. Excellent, excellent, was his prognosis. The words were like husks, light and disappointed. The ferry doesn't run today. It never runs on Sunday. The doctor fumbled with the stethoscope, placing it crooked around his neck. But it does run tomorrow, bright and early in the morning. Should you like, I could request that the hotel manager arrange a wake-up call. Once again, a fleeting smile came and went as quickly as a moth's wing flutters. Herbie beamed, trying to lighten the mood. Trying to, uh, get rid of me? I only assumed that after all this you might be finished with hairs allied. No offense meant... You'll be fit to leave bed rest tomorrow, and I thought you wouldn't be in the mood to ride horses. The doctor said it hastily, rubbing the back of his neck with a trembling hand. Then he cleared his throat and stiffened slightly, like he had heard something rustling behind him. I assume that's what you came for? To ride the horses? I think I'll stay, doctor, but thanks for the offer. Herbie scratched his face idly. There was actually one horse I've been thinking about. It's a really beautiful light color with a black stripe down its snout. I've seen it wandering around. Vernon licked his lips. With a black mane. Yeah, is it available tomorrow? Hazelai doesn't have a horse like that anymore. Herbie faltered. Uh-oh. He searched Dr. Vernon's face, looking for something that might betray a lie. Finding nothing, he shrugged. Okay, maybe I, I just dreamed it. Or perhaps the brochures, an old copy of the brochures. It was a very popular horse. Maybe. Dr. Vernon took out his handkerchief and cleaned his glasses. Well, if you don't have any questions concerning your concussion, I think I'll be off. Herbie nodded and extended a hand. Don't want to keep you, doctor. Thanks for looking after me. The doctor's rushed handshake was clammy. Certainly, certainly. He offered a meek grin, and then with a forced chuckle added, uh -huh, uh, well, Let's hope I never have to see you again. Here's to hoping, Herbie laughed. Yes, yes, to hoping. He already had a question ready for Robert when the horse returned that night. Who is Jeffrey Hansen? Robert polished his monocle with a white handkerchief while he walked up to the window on two legs. Who indeed, the horse echoed, peering through the lens, then tutting with disapproval. These damn smudges, he remarked. He offered another of his hideous smiles. I apologize for my French, though I suppose you speak it, having been taught in Paris, Mr. Caxton. Yeah. Yeah, I do. 
Pensez-vous vraiment, monsieur? Robert replaced the monocle and then averted his face bashfully. My French is quite messy. No, no, it, it's very good. But, but about Jeffrey, I brought the music, the horse said, producing a CD case from his tuxedo. He passed it over. I also brought something to sign it with. I can't imagine, I can't imagine you have many felt-tip pens in that room you've been in all this time. No, I don't, he said, receiving the marker and the case. It was the Seven Yellow Hen soundtrack, just as Robert had promised. It was Herbie Caxton's greatest work yet. Yet, the man felt strangely distant from the work as he yanked off the cap with his mouth and scribbled Herbie Caxton on the plastic. Ah, yes! Robert clapped his hands together and took it from him. Simply delightful. You have my thanks. The man raised a hand. Now, you're not very good at riddles, are you, Mr. Caxton? You're one of those types who flip to the back of the book quite a bit when you were a child, aren't you? I don't mean to be rude. The horse's eyes glinted as he interrupted. You just like to know. Yeah. A teapot and china mug were in Robert's hands now, and Herbie was not certain how they appeared there. The dapper horse poured a measure of tea into the cup and passed it over. I always find that story time goes best with a cup of hot tea. And to tell you the story of Jeffrey Hansen, I must tell you another story first. The horse looked at the man and seemed to cock a brow. Tell me, do you know what's been happening in Hazelide? The answer came in the form of a shaking head. Do you know who Jacqueline Legend is? No. Well, she was stabbed in the heart two nights ago. Quite a tragedy. Widow, two children. Likely they'll have to leave Hazelide. It's a shame. A terrible shame, I say. That's awful. Indeed. And does the name Beatrice Unser happen to ring a bell? Again, there was a shake of the head. I shouldn't think so. She was an ingrate and a drunkard. Miss Unser was found last night strewn bloody about her kitchen. Daughter discovered her while going to get a glass of water. She's only twelve and had to see her mother's intestines tangled on the floor. Herbie gagged faintly and covered his mouth. He squeezed his eyes shut. Among the rolling surf and the distant sound of thunder, he thought he could hear voices, angry voices outside in the distance. But I know for a fact you are aware of who Sarah Vernon is. The girl? Yes, Mr. Caxton. The girl. Is she dead? Quite! She died just tonight! Robert extracted a pocket watch from his vest and popped it open. That is as of 17 minutes ago. He looked off somewhere out of the man's limited frame of view, then poured himself some tea into another cup. Like Herbie, the horse's cup seemed to appear, but also seemed to have always been there. Do they know who did it? Seemingly lost in thought, Robert traced the rim of his teacup with a gloved finger, his long, cream face propped against a hand. No, unfortunately. Hazelide has its suspicions, however, and that's all they really need. The man furrowed his brow. What do you mean? Let me tell you the story of Jeffrey Hansen, said Robert, sipping his tea. He drummed his fingers against the window pane, and the sound irritated the man. In July of 2018, a man came here to Hazelide with his girlfriend and another friend. The man's name was Jeffrey Hansen, and at this very hotel, not two rooms from where you lay, he murdered Hattie Warren, his girlfriend. After he was done with her, he slit her throat, you see, he went on a spree killed three of the women in the village. Is that why you want me to know who he is? Is he... Herbie hesitated, choosing to sip his tea as he collected his words. Is he back? Robert threw back his head and laughed. 
and Herbie remembered it. It was a whinny, and it was burned at the edges, but it was also a laugh. Heavens no, that would be absurd, Robert sparked a toothy grin. It's merely a coincidence. On the surface, at least. A strong breeze drifted by, carrying a storm's electricity, distracting the horse from the conversation. His enormous nostrils flared and huffed as he sniffed the air. Do you smell that? He asked. Herbie shook his head. Smell what? Robert frowned. It's probably nothing. Anyway, our story doesn't end there. After his third victim, Hansen was caught by a man you know quite well, Dr. Bruce Vernon. It's plain to see something was out of place. One does not simply wander about Hazelite at so late an hour without suspicious intent. He sipped his tea and huffed approvingly through his snout. But there was also the blood. At any rate, he alerted the villagers and they engaged in the time-honored tradition of forming a posse. They chased Hansen through the woods, down one of the horse trails, quite a frightful sight with lanterns and flashlights and enough stopping power to occupy a town, and when they found him, his feet were bloodied from the brambles and rocks. Herbie shifted in bed, closer to the windowsill. His tea had grown cold, long since forgotten. What happened next? Robert drank again, holding a finger up for a pause. The hand that held the cup had its pinky out, and he set the cup back on the sill. They hanged him, he said plainly. They never found his friend, whom the town always assumed had helped Hansen. But I hear old Troy Nolan killed his own wife a few days ago before disappearing. Troy Nolan? The name sounded so familiar. Yes, Robert nodded, tracing the rim of his teacup again. Hansen's friend and alleged accomplice. His wife caught him in the middle of one of his more unsavory hobbies. How do you know all this? Herbie asked. How indeed? <laughs> I know what you know, and so much more. In the distance, thunder grumbled, masking the shock of shouting voices. The voices were indecipherable as the thunder grew insatiable. It crackled and boomed, summoning a splintered bolt of lightning. I apologize, Robert interjected, raising a gloved hand. I am a fool for trivia. What... What year was Seven Yellow Hens produced? 2019, I think, the man fumbled. Robert cocked his head and eyed him sidelong. Strange that you would only think so. I had a concussion, he pointed at the lump on his still bandaged head. Ah, yes, I heard. Drove into a horse, I heard. Quite dreadful. Did you happen to catch a glimpse of it? Might be a mare, I knew. Man squinted and thought. It was a light color, I think. He looked at cream-colored Robert. I, I, I didn't really have time to, to, to see or, or react. I, I, I just couldn't stop it. No, yes, uh, one never can. I understand. Robert nodded. I understand perfectly. Oh. Mm, I almost forgot. The horse extracted his copy of the best of Caxton from his tuxedo. Seven yellow hens signed may be a collector's item, but I am loath to confess that I love a good compendium. Would you care terribly to sign this one as well, please? Herbie stared at the CD case and the happy picture of its composer on the front. The man on the case had a full beard and short blonde hair. Herbie ran his fingers through his medium-length hair. It was black. The waves of Lake Michigan crashed rampantly against the shore, and the thunder bellowed. 
Another flash of lightning erupted against the pitch sky. Also, Robert said idly, drumming his fingers against the sill again. I have but one more thing I must impose upon you. I need to take the ferry tomorrow, and all they'll take is cash. I only have my debit card on me at present. I I bought too much fudge at the gift shops, you see. And this quaint little place doesn't have any ATMs. Mind if I borrow a few shekels? His nostrils flared, emphatic and intense with the huffing of a search. Goodness, what is that smell? Tearing his eyes from the CD case, the man crawled to the chest at the end of his cot, grabbed his pants and retrieved his wallet. His hands, wet and shiny and covered in something dark, shook as he fumbled with it. It, it, it's, it's, it's the rain, he said, from the, from, from the storm that's coming. No, 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 no. It's, it's, a, it's sad. A tad salty. It smells... Oh, it smells red. The horse bared his teeth in that hideous grin of his. Yes, yes, now I recognize it. It smells red. <laughs> He turned his head and peered at the man with his monocled eye. Another bolt of lightning cast a wicked glimmer across it. There's another riddle. Can you guess what I smell? The man opened his wallet and took out a few bills, handing them to Robert. But before the exchange was made fully, thunder cracked and lightning snapped, and the man saw something red stain the paper money. Blood? Robert reared back his head and amongst a cacophony of thunder and electricity laughed that horrible burned black laugh. The man looked back at the wallet and saw the driver's license. It read, Troy Nolan. He knew now what those voices had been shouting. (laughs) You'd better run, Robert chuckled with a sick grin. No, 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 the man, now Troy, cried. I I, I didn't do anything. You're right. I did. I did it for you. But they don't know anything about me. All they know is that you have got blood on your hands and that Sarah Vernon is dead. But, but, Robert held out a hand. Come with me. Troy Nolan shook his head violently. No, you got me into this mess. And I'm going to get you out of it, Mr. Nolan. But, but the island, the, 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 the ferry, they'll be looking for me at the ferry. The shouting was close now, and there was rattling from the door. It was locked. Come out, Mr. Caxton, we know you're in there. Dr. Vernon shouted from the other side. Troy looked at Robert. What other choice do you have? The horse said, his hand waiting with fingers stretched. Troy Nolan took the hand, and when he did, memories came flooding back to him. He had killed his wife, slit her throat from ear to ear, and he had killed those women. And he had liked it. He had loved it. He had killed so many more. The horse helped Troy out of the window, and the man tried walking but was overcome with nausea and puked on the grass. Robert heaved Troy into his arms and ran, carrying him past the houses, past the stables and the horses terrified by the storm, and into the forest. Behind him, flashlights pierced through the trees. Angry voices accompanied the thunder. Rain fell, whispering against the leaves. Robert stumbled and stepped into a muddy puddle. He cursed, muttering something about dry cleaning, but he did not stop running. But there was a tree, dead and rotting, at which Robert did stop. He panted heavy, heaving breaths and set Troy down. I I need a breather, Mr. Nolan. Troy indicated the approaching mob of flashlights, screaming over the immense downpour. But they're coming! Well, I'm tired. I had to carry you, remember? But but you're a horse! No, Robert said, futilely attempting to wipe his brow in the rain with his handkerchief. I'm 
you, Mr. Nolan. Another bout of nausea rose into Troy's throat, and he leaned against the rotten tree. A flash of lightning illuminated something dangling from one of the rotten branches. A cord of mottled rope. A noose. Troy called out to Robert, pointing at the rope, but the horse was gone. Troy looked down, and his feet were bloody, stuck by the brambles and cut by the stones. But but Robert had carried him here. He was certain of nothing else but that. The mob was fast approaching, screaming their furious curses and promises of terrible atrocities. Troy Nolan looked up at the noose again and covered his face. He couldn't stop it. He couldn't stop any of it. Thank you for sharing my nightmares and helping me carry the grief. If you enjoy the show, please share your favorite nightmare with a friend or family member. Don't forget to leave a rating. Remember to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you'd like to go the extra mile, you can join my Patreon for $3 a month and you can cancel at any time. Or you can buy my book on Amazon. I've put links to both in the description. I'd love to connect with you on Instagram, Facebook, or Threads. Just look for Nightmares and Grief, and you'll find me. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Good night.